Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Dr. Kathy Kyle, and I will be your MC today. I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina, the Nakota Nations, <clears throat> excuse me, the Metis Nation, Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in Treaty 7 of Southern Alberta, where I am honored to live, work, and play. I am a member and current chair of the CVMA Wellness Advisory Group, and also the leading force behind the Merck Animal Health CVMA Time to Talk About Mental Health in Vet Med, of which today's webinar and panel discussion is part of the campaign. Today's topic is a community approach to suicide prevention and mental health promotion in veterinary workplaces. And this is in honor of World Suicide Prevention Day, which is coming up on September the 10th. Suicide touches all of us, many of us, in both personal and professional ways, and it's heart-wrenching and it's tragic. My sincere condolences to all of you who are grieving or have grieved for the loss of a loved person. As such, please join me in a few moments of silence to remember those we have lost. Thank you. And I'm hopeful that having the opportunity to be in this community today provides all of you with the compassionate energy you need wherever you are in your healing and recovery journey. It's important to talk about these topics, mental health and suicide awareness and prevention, yet I realize talking about it can feel raw and unnerving at times. And this information today in the webinar is very important. So we have two safety supports in place for all of you today. First off, we have the most amazing peer supporter, Dr. Leanne Benendetti. And Leanne will be available for one-on-one -on -one private message chat uh, if you are feeling overwhelmed and want to reach out and talk with someone. So thank you, Leanne, for being here. And also the next slide, Lori, has a list of safety supports. So if you are struggling and you're having thoughts of suicide, please think about who you will tell and when you will tell them. Maybe it's someone in your trusted social network, perhaps it's your general practitioner, uh, maybe someone you do talk therapy with, psychologist or counselor, for instance, through the employee assistance plans that many of our VMAs offer, maybe it's a spiritual um, advisor. And if you are uncertain who to turn to, to talk with, there are trained volunteers and people ready to listen on the Canadian Distress and Suicide Line and the phone number is on the slide. The list of all these safety resources is on a, as a PDF on the CVMA website. The CE certificate for this talk is also on the CVMA website. And I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing me talk. So let me just introduce our most amazing speakers and then I will turn it over to them. So first off, Dixie Estrin. Dixie is a Métis woman from Edmonton, Alberta. She comes with a background in nursing, mental health and life skill and peer support coaching. She holds a master level as a trainer in assist applied suicide intervention skills training. She has been touched by suicide on a personal and professional level and developed a compassion for this work when she became a trainer over 13 years ago. She enjoys delivering the training and working with diverse populations throughout Alberta. She also supports the Edmonton Region CMHA, Canadian Mental Health Association Distress Line in Edmonton, supporting the volunteer suicide intervention training. Dixie presents suicide awareness presentations to various agencies and communities. Courses in suicide prevention intervention that Dixie delivers are the ASSIST two-day intervention training. I've taken it. It's one of the best two days you could spend in your life. The ASSIST tune-up renewal of ASSIST certificate training, I've taken that too, it's fantastic. The Safe Talk three and a half hour workshop that alerts someone to warning signs indicating risk of suicide, again, a fabulous course. One moment. And River of Life, which is an interactive half day workshop created for individuals working with Indigenous young people 12 and up and other suicide awareness talks and presentations. 
Next, we have Dr. Reza Hajazi. Dr. Hajazi is a veterinary program specialist with the Canadian federal government and a part-time small animal practitioner. He is a certified mental health first aid instructor, MHFA, with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, a trained MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction facilitator with the Center for Mindfulness Studies, and an emergency medical responder with Alberta College of Paramedics. And we also have Dr. Phil Richmond. Dr. Richmond is the Chief Medical and Wellbeing Officer for Veterinary United and also the founder of Flourishing Phoenix Veterinary Consultants. Dr. Richmond is a speaker and published writer, a frequent veterinary podcast guest, and holds multiple certifications in the fields of applied positive psychology, workplace well being, psychological health and safety, trauma informed workplaces, resilience training, behavior change, and suicide prevention. Dr. Richmond is certified to teach the QPR, the Question, Persuade, Refer um, suicide prevention course, which right now is available as an asynchronous online course <clears throat> being offered um, by the American VMA, free to all veterinary professionals. And I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. Uh, and Dr. Richmond received a Florida VMA Gold Star for Service in 2019 and a Florida VMA Veterinarian of the Year in 2021. Um, so with that, I will turn the first uh, speak uh, opportunity to speak over to Dr. Richmond, and I will be monitoring chat. So please, if you have any questions, place them in the chat, and I will be able to um, refer those back to the speakers. And thank you again for joining. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's just really my my honor to share with uh with my friends and colleagues uh from the great white north and and just want to honor uh the what what you do in the workplace um in in canada um to to help uh our colleagues and workers um you're very much ahead of us here in the u.s so uh i do do want to, i put this slide up just to say you know why why in the heck would a veterinarian uh you know have degrees or have certifications in applied positive psychology and resilience training and these types of things. Um, one is I am kind of uh, addicted to, uh, to certifications and I see that that's it's a bit extra that that slide. Um, but to get serious for a moment is say why you know why am I here with this great group of people talking about this subject. Um, in 2008 I was a new grad veterinarian. Uh, I was out about a year year and a half. And I was working about 70 hours or so. Uh, this was self-imposed, so it was not the choice of my employer. I was working on my days off. I was working in the animal hospital that I grew up working in. I was picking up emergency shifts. And the stressors of that night really became overwhelming. Um, I was, you know, I was out of hope and solutions. Uh, you know, and I had one tool in the toolbox, and that was alcohol and substances. And I got to a point in in my career where I was coming home every night. I had a nine, you know, river nine millimeter bomb in bed. And I had a plan if A, B, or C happened, then I was going to make that decision. And thank goodness my colleagues recognized what was going on with me. And frankly, if it wasn't for veterinarians, veterinary medicine, veterinary professionals, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here today. Going back, so, uh, you know, I was given this gift and I just want to honor, um, you know, again, I, I, as Kathy had mentioned, I was very grateful to be the uh, 2021 FVMA Veterinarian of the Year, and it was in Orlando. And the first clinic that I worked at, the people that helped save my life are in this picture uh, that you see before you. So there's um, Dr. Paul Jansen uh, right here, uh, uh, Alex Soto, who was our head technician. She's actually the one that uh, moved this forward. So she was the one who noticed the things going on with me. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Nanette Parada Wagner. So these three people did what can potentially be done in a veterinary hospital, and they had the courage to to step up and and like I said, they they helped save my life. So that's the personal aspect of it, clinically, or or what we see in the research and the surveys. Uh, you know, there's a number of this quite a bit of data that's out there and we're going to go through some of that right now so in 2014 there was a survey that was published in the journal of the american veterinary medical association from randall met and his group from the cdc 
uh, it showed in that survey that 9% of veterinarians experience serious psychological distress. That's distress that's severe enough to, to cause moderate to serious impairment in things in a social nature, occupational nature, school, uh, just our day-to-day -day functioning, and they require treatment. So 10% of people required intervention and most did not get it. 31% uh, experienced depressive episodes. Uh, in this survey, this was 2014, 17% of veterinarians that were surveyed had suicidal ideations. Another survey in 2017 showed 24.9, um, and that was in US veterinarians. And then a study that was, was published in, in JAVMA for Canadian veterinarians by Perrette uh, and, and uh, the group there. In 2020, 26.2% of veterinarians had suicidal ideations. So this is certainly, and this is, you know, around the time of the pandemic. So this is certainly, uh, you know, increased in frequency, um, most likely. Two landmark studies in 19, or, uh, 2019 um, from the CDC and also from Auburn University in, in uh, Alabama in the U.S. Uh, showed the first study um, from the, the CDC uh, showed that male veterinarians were 2.1 times more, more likely uh, to die by suicide or had a higher risk of suicide than the general population, and 3.5 times higher risk in female veterinarians. Tracy Witte's uh, study in September of 2019 showed a little bit different figures, but still certainly elevated compared to the general population. 1.6 times higher risk in the general population in male veterinarians and 2.4 times the risk in female veterinarians. A study that was done, I think, around 2015-ish in the UK showed that veterinarians were four times more likely to die by suicide. Um, also in the 2019 study by Tracy Witte was the first time we had some data on veterinary technicians, uh, and it did show, uh, if I have the numbers right, I think it was uh, female veterinary technicians um, were 2.6 times more likely to die by suicide, and male technicians were five times uh, more likely. Sample size potentially could have been an issue with the male uh, technicians, but those were the numbers that were, were published. The Merck Wellbeing Study, which uh, is published uh, every biannual or every every other year uh, in the U.S., uh, in the initial study in 2018, veterinarians that were surveyed only 41% recommended a career in veterinary medicine. Um, what's really upsetting, you know, as as a veterinarian, is that 24 only 24% of veterinarians under the age of 35 recommended the profession. That that hurts. Um, the top three concerns at that time in that survey that was published in 2018, high student debt, stress level of the job, and high suicide risk of veterinarians. So we ask ourselves, what's holding us back from getting, getting help? Um, one of the reasons, one of the studies that was shown in 2017 that was published in the Journal of the Veterinary Medical uh, Education showed these four factors influenced the reluctance to seek mental health treatment by medical students, fear of expulsion, fear of reputational damage, fear of failure to meet expectations. I think we can all relate to that. But the fourth one really speaks to the stigma of seeking help in, in our profession. And this wasn't 20 years ago. This was 2017. And I know there was just recently a study that, that echoed these numbers in, Amer in U.S. veterinary students. Um, but the strong belief that mental illness is unacceptable, that it's a fitness the practice issue that can lead to dismissal. So why does that happen in, in veterinary medicine? Certainly we select for perfectionists. Uh, what Elizabeth Strand and her group, uh, Jen Brandt, um, found in a, a study is that veterinarians score higher statistically significant uh, scores that are higher on neuroticism on the big five personality assessment. That means we significantly overthink things. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Student loan debt here in the U.S. Um, is uh, up to six hundred thousand now. Some students from offshore schools are are graduating with that. Uh, and these numbers of 70, 75 to eighty k U.S. Um, that was uh, a couple of years ago. Moral distress, being trained to help our patients and not being able to give 
give them the care that they need. Usually this is due to financial reasons, workplace stress, uh, need for improved skills and resiliency, and that we are trained as veterinarians, we're trained to euthanasia as an acceptable method to relieve suffering. A very big issue or, or area that's being studied by Tracy Whitty and a number of other folks, in fact, I'm, I'm involved in a uh, access to means assessment from a, a graduate student from, uh, from Florida State, is access to means uh, with pentobarbital. Veterinarians, female veterinarians are overrepresented, or I think veterinarians in general uh, may, may not have that, but veterinarians are overrepresented for poisoning um, in, in the US for dying by suicide. Um, and that is due to our access and knowledge of the use of pentobarbital. Regarding alcohol and substance use disorder, which I talked about my story, um, what addiction specialists tell us, most of the data that we have is on physicians. Unfortunately, we do a very poor job in veterinary medicine getting the message out uh, about alcohol and substance use. Uh, approximately 12 to 15 percent of physicians at some point in their career uh, are going to meet criteria for a use disorder. In a 2015 Mayo Clinic survey of about 7,300 physicians, they found that it was 14.9 um, percent of male physicians and 21.4% of female physicians met criteria for alcohol use disorder. That's just alcohol, not, not uh, any substances. This is really the, the key um, that we don't talk about is that when we have adverse childhood experiences, this is childhood trauma. On this ACEs assessment, which is a 10 question assessment, I, I really invite you to take that and potentially have your staff take that as well. If you have, if you answer yes to four or more of those experiences, or if you had four or more of those experiences, it's not written in stone, but you're seven to 10 times more likely to have a use disorder and 30 times more likely to attempt suicide. Opioid and benzodiazepine use disorders are five times higher in medical professionals than they are in the general public. Um, that has to do with access. This study recently just came out for post-pandemic use in physicians. Uh, what we found in that study, and that was and that was just published last month, one in seven physicians admit to consuming alcohol or controlled substances at work. One in seven. So we, again, remember we don't seek help. We 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 should be able to fight through this. Um, and the, the uh, you know the culture of of hustle and and put your head down and work through it unfortunately is still prevalent in in human medicine and veterinary medicine. One in seven physicians there, uh, more than one in five, five say that they consume alcohol or controlled substances multiple times per day, and seventeen percent say that they consume alcohol or a controlled substance at least once a day. The wonderful thing is, is in medical professionals, 78% of physicians have no return to alcohol or substance use during a five-year contract uh, if they're under treatment. Um, that is better than any, any uh, um, chronic disease that we see, of course. Well, certainly, we're having high levels of burnout. I'm going to go through all of this, um, but if we go to this slide right here, uh, it does show this is, this is the 20... 2022 um, Merck Animal Health Wellbeing Study. This showed, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit over 50% of veterinarians uh, were either in high burnout or moderate burnout. A study that came out of Cornell actually showed via the Pro QOL, which is a very good assessment, um, that over half of veterinarians that took that um, were in were in a high level of burnout. Also interesting, and this goes into work design, psychological health and safety, and on an organizational level, what needs to be done. Um, this was a white paper that was put out by uh, Ivan Zach's group of Galaxy Vets. I believe they got their data through the Stanford Physician uh, Wellbeing Index. When veterinarians saw 21 or more patients, that was statistically significant for burnout. Um, so that is an organizational thing that has nothing to do with resilience. That has nothing to do with mental illness. Um, that is an external work factor um, that increases our level of burnout. So, you know, when we're seeing, and I know personally at our clinic, we went from seeing, you know, I went from seeing anywhere from 20 to 30 patients a day. And that was a busy day. You know, if we were seeing 30, 
um, upwards of 45. Um, it's just untenable. So what are some of the things that are being done um, here in the US and in Florida? Uh, I also serve on the, the Workplace Suicide Prevention and Prevention Committee. Um, we're doing many of these things, which, which is wonderful. We do have free access to QPR uh, suicide prevention gatekeeper training. That's a one hour course. Um, so you know, the, the safe talk and the mental health first aider courses are very rich and robust, um, but they do take some time. Um, so if you do wanna do something over lunch, uh, you know, the lunch hour with the clinic, the QPR uh, asynchronous course is, is quite good. Um, and that can also be done uh, via webinar. Um, but you can see all of these these things that are being done. I also serve on the <laughs> Veterinary Visionaries uh, Committee in the U.S. here, sponsored by uh, the American Animal Hospital Association. Uh, Coral uh, Doherty, who's on this call, I think I saw her name, uh, was the winning winning idea based on the Canadian standards for workplace uh, workplace well being and workplace psychological health and safety. Um, Kathy's also on that as well as as well as Leanne. And we're working with, we, we have a huge Canadian contingent that's helping, helping uh, lift us up here in the US. And so we're very grateful. Um, one of the things on a policy level that can potentially be done is if we look at the, um, uh, if we look here at the medical licensing questions, like in Florida, um, any questions on a licensing exam that, that speak about mental health negatively affect physicians in this, in this case. Um, negatively affected physicians seeking mental health treatment. Um, so we, we actually went to the Florida Board of Veterinary Medicine um, and showed them these questions that actually used the term insanity um, up until 2019. Uh, and we had these questions removed. So very good stuff. Um, in the US, there are a number of national veterinary organizations for the advancement of well-being, uh, which is great. You can see those here. I'm just going to go through these slides really quick. Uh, we were talking about resilience. Resilience is incredibly important. Um, however, I also like to say that the Dalai Lama himself, if he was quadruple booked with 15 minute appointments, would probably drop the F bomb. Um, so individual resilience is important, but it's it's team resilience, team growth, team well being, and organizational resilience, organizational growth, organizational well being. Um, those three things need to be in place. Um, some of the questions that you can ask, and we can put these poll questions up if, uh, if we'd like, is asking yourself in your clinic right now, day one, you know, things we can do by the end of the day is answer these questions. Um, does, your, does your practice have a wellness or well-being policy if you went to leadership? <clears throat> Phil, that, I see that the poll went live and I think people are answering. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we've, we've got, um, you know, 60-40 split. Really happy to see that 40% 40, 40 split. I don't know that we would have that, uh, you know, have it that high uh, here in the U.S., those would be that have 60 as we can just start getting curious and say it doesn't have to be a huge policy because we can always add on to it. What can we do tomorrow, you know, to sit down as a group and talk about it? And I, just for sake of time, we won't put up the rest of the poll questions, but you see those questions up, you can ask, you know, ask leadership. Are we regularly assessing burnout and well-being in our staff? Do we allow mental health days? Um, and this is in the U.S. where um, that's that's actually a, a bigger thing if someone, uh, you know, if a practice actually does that. Um, psychological safety, how are mistakes handled? Um, how is conflict handled? Because that's a big, big area of uh, workplace stress. And then lastly, very simple day one things that we can do. Do we have a QPR or mental health first aid or, or safe talk? Do we have somebody that's trained in leadership uh, or, or the staff um, in suicide prevention? So those are some box checking things that we can do day one to, to help improve. Our other two uh, speakers have a lot to talk about um, that's gonna be helpful. And I just wanna say in closing, I just wanna honor all of you that are here today. 
and just taking a breath, sitting here in the Tampa airport, grateful to be here with you, that I truly believe you that are in this, this webinar right now are the tide that will lift all ships, and that you're the future of well-being in our profession. You're the ones who are going to lead us into the next chapter of veterinary medicine. And I really look forward to the day that we've created a culture of positivity, personal growth, and well-being as the new normal in practice. And I thank you all for being light bringers to our profession and the work that each one of you do. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Hopeful. You're doing amazing things, and your humor is wonderful. Thank you. We'll now move to Dr. Reza Hajazi. Uh, before uh, starting my talk, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Kathy Kyle for the invite and also uh, acknowledge and appreciate her role on advancing mental health uh, portfolio within veterinary community. Thank you, Kathy. I think that's very important to say. We are all um, uh, appreciating uh, when someone holding the light and providing positive uh, support and uh, giving us uh, a platform to discuss things uh, in a safe space that you have been providing for us. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, before further ado, I would like to share this screen with everyone. I, uh, anticipated technical issue on, on my side. So I did record uh, the presentation, which will be available to you all after. Um, before uh, we move forward, I would like to um, discuss uh, the definition of mental health. It includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, and it affects how we think, feel, and act. It uh, also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. When you um, look into what uh, World Health Organization provided, uh, they always um, talk about a balance, a balance between physical, mental, and social well-being. And when this balance get, uh, gets uh, affected, um, suicidal thoughts perhaps would be the case. Suicide is the result of action taken to deal with the intolerable mental anguish and pain, fear, shame, uh, despair that overwhelms an individual values for living and hoping life. Uh, while uh, studies uh, shows that uh, there is a well-established link between suicide and depression, each suicide um, happens in a unique uh, mix of uh, complex interconnected factors that you can see on a screen. Uh, when I was putting this presentation together, I was looking into where can I find a list of indicators that can help me to detect the sign of uh, suicide. And um, it, through my, my research, I uh, bump into um, a tool that um, put together by American Association of uh, Suicidology uh, in order to help us to navigate uh, through the um, signs of suicide. And you can see it on the screen. And uh, you, one way or another, if you have impacted by uh, suicide uh, of, of uh, loved ones uh, around you, uh, you can identify uh, uh, maybe all, maybe few, maybe one, but uh, these are, these are a suggestion. This is our a, a starting point to uh, start the conversation. When um, I started it, um, my uh, first work in uh, one of the practices, I missed the warning signs. And as a result, um, I had to go to the first uh, funeral a um, few months after uh, the work that I started with that practice, simply because I didn't see it. I could have uh, started the conversation and changed somebody's life, but I didn't notice those signs and I uh, didn't have the training to, uh, to start the conversation. 
And I'm so pleased and excited uh, to see after a few years where we are and how the conversation uh, turned to be so in depth and stigmatizing thoughts are vanishing little by little in our workplaces that people are feeling safe to come forward and start the conversation uh, with us. In order to um, create that environment, we need to um, establish um, a safe place by having people who are trained on mental health first aid as part of our team in order to recognize um, um, the risks within our veterinary environment and looking into potential triggers that might cause uh, folks to get to that state, losing their balance, losing their purpose, and become hopeless and helpless, and initiating the conversation by reducing uh, the stigmatizing thoughts in our workplaces and uh, ensuring that the person uh, who is experiencing crisis or emergency is safe from harming themselves and others. And that's kind of basically having a benefit of uh, such a trained employees in our workplace. I listed it, um, uh, a few items here, but if you look into it, you can see um, how the practice would benefit from having the trained employees on mental health. And again, they can promote um, a self-care plan for, for, for the practice. Uh, they can build a resilience in the workplace as an advocate. They can um, help people get into their recovery plan and provide an environment where people can come to uh, meetings discussing uh, what is really, really bothering them and are open to discuss and provide solution in order to feel better before they go home. And that's what is, um, what is lacking right now. We need to uh, foster an environment, a safe environment where people uh, truly discuss their anxiety, their, their issues, um, either home-related or, or work-related. Um, I would like to share a, a, a YouTube uh, a clip with you that shows how easy it is by just listening and um, validating the feeling of the person would be a strong tool for us to consider as we move forward to, to the rest of the presentation. On March 11th, 2005, Kevin Berthia hit rock bottom. He decided to come here to the Golden Gate Bridge to end his life. What happened that day on this bridge changed his life forever. I was going through so many different things internally. Um, I've just become a new father, just recently lost my job. Um, just, it was so many different things. All the things I didn't handle in my life end up coming up on that day, March 11, 2005, and I felt like I didn't have a choice. Uh, I was tired of living a lie. I was tired of, you know, keeping this mask on, acting like everything was fine when everything wasn't okay. And I just got overwhelmed that day. I didn't see, I didn't see a way out. Berthia grew up in Oakland and had never been to the Golden Gate Bridge. He didn't even know how to get here and had to ask for directions. I was banking on whoever I asked for directions, they would look at me and say, you know, wh why do you want to go? Because part of me wanted to tell why I wanted to go. And part of me needed to know I needed to go, but the other part really, really wanted to just say why I wanted to be there, that I was just tired of living a lot. And did anyone ask? Nobody ever asked. California Highway Patrol Officer Kevin Briggs, who became known as a guardian of the Golden Gate Bridge, spotted Berthia just as he jumped over the railing. If I had 50-foot hands to reach out and grab him, that's what I felt like. But the only thing I could do was yell something to him. And I can't remember what I yelled, but I yelled. And, and he reached out and caught that rail, swung around, hit it. But I didn't know that he had reached out and caught it. I thought he was gone. What happened next is captured in this haunting photo. For 92 minutes, they talked. 
started at the age of five and I worked myself up, up to the age of 22. He learned about 17 years of my pain, uh, my heartache, the things that I wanted to just tell people, the things that I was going through, the things that were overwhelming me, the things that really brought me to the bridge. He was a complete stranger. Yeah. What made you decide to just open up to him? It was something about who he was. It was the compassion. You have to understand something. I never opened my eyes once. I never knew Sergeant Briggs was a cop or I never, I never knew he was white. So this whole conversation that we had for 92 minutes, I never knew anything about him. I thought he was a, a just a compassionate bystander. If I would open my eyes, conversation probably would have been a little different because where I'm from, Oakland, California, my identity, my my look at how I looked at law enforcement at the time was, was completely different from how I look at law enforcement now. So it was just something about his voice. It's just... It's just he just wouldn't give up. He made me feel like if we had to talk for nine, ten hours, ten days, he would just be willing to listen. And that's what he was looking for, was somebody to listen to him. My job was what could I tell him to make him want to come back over? What did he tell me that I could take in? So I kept thinking about this. I go, his child, pretty much for any parent. So I started talking about his child more. Tell me more and more and more about her. Eventually, Officer Briggs and another officer helped Berthia back over the railing and took him to the hospital. Eight years later, the two reconnected when Berthia was asked to give Officer Briggs a public service award in New York. And that's when Berthia says Officer Briggs saved his life again. By 2013, I was up to 22 failed suicide attempts. So when I met Officer Briggs um, at that New York Life Service Theater, it was literally after 222 failed suicide attempts and me trying to figure out how I was going to get myself out of pain again. And meeting him just kind of revamped me to help me see that I really, really needed to live. And I had a reason to live after I told my story there in New York. That night, Berthia realized he wasn't alone and telling his story on stage helped other people. Now Berthia is a public speaker and a passionate advocate for suicide prevention and started the Kevin Berthia Foundation. You got to realize my whole life I felt like I was alone. I'm, I'm an African-American man coming from an African-American community who doesn't talk about, you know, depression or mental health or suicide prevention. So, I mean, I didn't even know that, that what I had. I mean, I didn't know what I was up against. We never had conversations. We never had talks about it. So I just felt like I was different. So to get to that, you know, to get to New York and finally get to talk about something openly and be vulnerable and be honest and people embrace me, it was just, it was life changing. Officer Briggs retired from the CHP in 2013 after responding to hundreds of suicide calls on the Golden Gate Bridge. Officer Briggs is now a mental health and suicide prevention speaker. The look in people's eyes when I would look at them when they were over the rail was, you know, the desperate. I could see some hope. They wanted to live, but they didn't know how, and they were just so tired of living in the agony. Now, that's what really drove me to want to do this job better. Officer Briggs and Berthia say they might come from two different backgrounds, but they were brought to this bridge that day for a reason. And now they both use that story to save lives by letting people know there is hope and help. Lisa Chan, KCBS. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, uh, for looking into uh, this uh, this uh, uh, video, I, I would like to invite you to share your thoughts, your reflections um, after watching uh, this video. If you would like to share any uh, anything with uh, with your colleagues and other participants, that would be uh, wonderful. Um, going back to our presentation, uh, looking into this uh, uh, video and, and and information that was shared with you, it's. It's um, obviously having uh, active uh, listening and uh, showing uh, the concern is a strong, a strong uh, uh, tool that we can we can all use. You know, talking with folks that are experiencing uh, crisis or emergency and reassuring them that they are not alone uh, goes uh, a long way. And uh, looking into ways to uh, bring some hope and light uh, into their mind uh, uh, would, would be very helpful. Um, again, um, we are not alone. There are a lot of resources out there. Uh, if you um, connect them with uh, with a crisis uh, hotline, any counselor or a, a person that they can talk to decompress, to, to share their pain and agony, that would be a a wonderful uh, uh, way of uh, protecting them as they go through um, uh, their recovery. There are a lot of uh, resources, as I said, available to you. Uh, it's going to be shared uh, during this, uh, this conversation uh, through chat room and also uh, will be uh, 
part of our information sharing after this uh, webinar. Um, I want to um, have this final slide uh, uh, as a final thoughts and, and uh, message that you can take home. We really need to uh, start the work. We need to set up a workplace well-being program. And how does it look like? It is based on um, what is happening. You know, you need to do um, underlying issues that cause burnout in, in your workplace, whatever it would be. And, and participate in, in the events and trainings and CE opportunities to better understand uh, what is happening uh, in your um, community. There are um, a lot of free of charge programs that would help you to uh, put together your program. And I just listed one here for your uh, considerations. And in, by the end, we need to um, have a preventative measure. I mean, it's like a, being uh, uh, thirsty. We, we shouldn't get into the point that we need to implement something right away. We need to have a culture of uh, self-care implemented in our workplace where the balance is there, where we all can financially, emotionally, physically, and socially feel uh, balanced and feel together and, and talk about things that cause a stressful uh, situation in our practice day in and day out. We shouldn't take anything home. We shouldn't come uh, to work um, not being supported about what is happening in our uh, community. We need to have an open conversation um, in order to prevent uh, this type of uh, situation where people uh, reach to this point in their life that uh, suicide is, is the only option. I want to also hope for all of us to, uh, to think there will be a time that mental health first aid discussion is as a simple and easy conversation as uh, physical health. The way that we talk about CPR, the way that we talk about mental health uh, would, be, would be the same. And uh, I want to uh, thank in my final uh, uh, seconds here um, from uh, CBMA, uh, their support, and also thanking you for joining this conversation. Uh, I hope again, uh, this information was and is useful for you to uh, start uh, thinking how you can have a uh, mental health plan in your workplace. Thank you, and now I pass the conversation to Kathy. Thank you, Reza, for your vulnerability and openness and sharing your experience, wisdom, and expertise. Thank you for being open in the telling. And now we will transition to Dixie. Dixie, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kudos to both my uh, former speakers, because I think you've pretty well summarized most of what I wanted to say. And I think just the bringing home that when we're talking about community and building in the work practices, um, I believe that I, that starts in our homes too. It's a community issue and being able to be open and destigmatize is, is incredibly important in the language we use. I think when we can use the language of suicide, died by suicide, um, things like that, rather than committed, you know, watching our language, being open, being willing to listen. So when we talk about safe talk language, um, you know, and you're well aware that Kathy's very involved with safe talk, it's, um, I think, really incredibly important that people get more comfortable with the conversation. And sometimes courses like that can be helpful to do that. However, I want to bring back home that in the community, in your families, in your work practices, just having conversations, just being that person to say, I'm noticing, I'm noticing you seem really agitated, or I've noticed that, you know, you're missing more work. But those are all invitations. It can be different for everyone. What brings me to suicide might never in a million years take you to suicide. And the reality is, is probably 20% of us, at least on this call right now today, have thoughts of suicide. Now, does that 
mean we're suicidal? No, not necessarily. But having thoughts is not necessarily, you know, um, it can be a warning factor. It can be the start of that, but it does not necessarily mean that, that we're going to suicide. However, open, honest communication, reaching out to each other can certainly stop that process of moving forward. So when we're reaching out to a colleague, it's to be non-judgmental, to be open to listening, to just hearing, to know that we don't have to fix the problem. And that for many years as a trainer was my, my, um, my negative side is I always thought I had to fix something and learning that I did not have to fix anything. I just needed to be there and present and walk beside somebody in that journey. And that alone can change somebody's life. It can open up the opportunity for help. So things like I am listening and I'm here for you, um, being non-judgmental. Um, removing, I really heard a lot this morning about removing of lethal means whenever possible or working in safe conditions. Um, and that, that pertains to, as um, you know, was mentioned, you know, the, what, are, what is our use of alcohol and drugs? Most people die under the influence. So again, you know, anything that can help us in a, in a holistic mental health way to reduce that risk can be helpful. Um, there's just so much here. Um, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, the positivity in just looking at that light and how we can build community is one of the most important things I think that came out of this morning. And honoring the legacy of people who have passed from suicide versus the method in how they died. I, I think it's more about um, anything along that line. Kathy, I could talk and I could go on and on, but I think I'm doing a lot of repeating. So I'm going to move it back to you in case you would prefer to use the last few minutes for opening up for questions or anything particular. Thank you, Dixie. You read my mind. I just placed in the chat um, an open invitation. If anyone does have questions or comments, uh, please place them in the chat. And uh, Dixie, I appreciated what you said, many of what you said, but also the do not need to fix the problem and walking alongside someone. Uh, and as we wait for um, any questions to come in in the chat, which I'll monitor, perhaps just review um, if someone is noticing invitations or warning signs, how could they start that conversation with someone to let them know that they are noticing and they are the kind of person who is okay to talk about if the answer is yes, I'm thinking about suicide, to let that other person know that they are, that they're okay hearing that. They're, they're not going to dismiss or be scared or judgmental. And I think using our gut, that's the biggest thing I could say is use your gut, your intuition, your spidey sense. If something feels off, inquire, get curious about it, create a conversation. Thank you. And I don't see any questions in the chat. So let me then ask, I think Dr. Richmond had to jump onto a plane. So he is no longer available. However, may I ask um, both of you, going back to actually something Dr. Richmond did talk about, which is resiliency. What are, you, what are both of your thoughts, uh, Reza and, and Dixie on, what can be done to reduce the risks for all to build resiliency? And not just in individuals like the veterinary professional, what can we do from a team or a work environment so that we can all stay as mentally healthy as we can? Well, I personally believe a lot of them were already mentioned, but when we're working with people that do seem to be in distress, I think what's most important from my perspective is, is to listen to that pain first and allow that person to express that. Because through listening to that pain in that dark side, the light side is going to present itself because there's something keeping that person still alive today. So there is resiliency there. It's a matter of, can we tap into that resiliency? And then that goes back to on an everyday level. Uh, I think Dr. Reza, you've talked a lot about how to build that resiliency on a day-to-day -day level. So I'll, I'll flip it, let you have a couple of seconds here. Thank you, Dixie. And I want to echo the, the same message here that, uh, um, I lead and um, provide uh, support to a big team. And one of the things that I have learned is um, talking about the issues that they have in their minds, you know, having early morning discussion before we start. And before we go home, talking about things that uh, went wrong, things if we did great, things that we need to improve. And, you know, giving a chance uh, to everyone to, to share 
how they saw what they what they experienced that create a bridge and understanding to create a, a strong uh, community a team that can be resilient and deal with issues uh, the next day and they leave and they discuss things uh, right at work not taking things uh, back to their uh, uh, home or vice versa I see thank you both comment yeah. in the chat there, Kathy. Yes, thank you, Dixie. And thank you both for Reza and Dixie for commenting on that. So there's um, a comment in the chat. I think that one has to be careful in how they engage with people they are concerned about. We don't want to shame the individual by indicating that they have noticed a failure to perform as that can create further angst. What are your comments to that? Well, to me, I, I think, yes, absolutely. We always want to be professional, but at the same time, being professional can also mean being human. And I think how we approach that is going to make the difference. You know, if it's a judgmental thing, yes, it's going to turn somebody off and it becomes very frightening. However, if we approach them in, I've noticed that such and such is happening. It's, you know, can you tell me what's going on? Or, you know, just opening that conversation up, but in an inviting, caring, loving way versus a judgmental way. Maybe somebody else wants to add to that. I, uh, if I may, I, I, I think um, when we talk about uh, listening and engaging non judgmentally, uh, we all should uh, ensure that we are not enforcing enforcing our, our, our thoughts in, into the conversation. This is not all about us. This is about them connecting, trusting, and coming forward. And then the information, the the issue has started to roll in. And I, I've been um, part of a lot of conversation. And in my experience, we need to just be around that person, share a space, and then things will, uh, will fall through and they feel comfortable to, to talk to us. And that will uh, go a long way rather than we are just inquiring, forcing and putting that person to the corner, asking what's going on. It should be a, it should be a their choice. They should feel that they have options to talk or not, and they are not again faced to another things that they cannot change in their life. They have an option to talk. And I've actually experienced that in a, in a work situation where uh, one of my employees was able to come to not come to me, but I inquired as to I'd noticed a few things. And when I inquired, it created the conversation and I was able to walk that person through getting assistance and, you know, taking some time off and coming back to work eventually. And it can be done. And isn't that key in what one is noticing and sharing with the other person? Because the noticing doesn't need to be anything to do with that matter, their competency or what they're doing in the clinic or not. It could just be noticing that someone is withdrawing from others at work or or missing work and mentioning those things and saying, um, you know, I'm noticing this in you. you know, do you want to talk about it? I'm a safe person to talk with. And in safe talk, and it's best to learn the whole safe talk methodology. But one of the things you learn in safe talk is letting people know what you're noticing. So the invitation sticks, as you mentioned. And then just one way of asking is, sometimes when people are withdrawing from work or missing work or withdrawing from family and friends, they're thinking of suicide. Are you thinking of suicide? Because by asking or by mentioning that sometimes, it doesn't mean all the time, it might not be. Suicide might not be on their mind, yet you're letting them know that you are a safe person to talk with and they can choose when to talk with you and to share more uh, in that compassionate, vulnerable way that you're really walking with them in the support, that you're not being judgmental. And to me, it gives permission to speak for them to speak about it, because most people are not going to come up to you and tell you that they're thinking of suicide mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they are afraid of judgment and fear of all the repercussions, whereas doing it the other way, um, it gives permission for them to talk about it in a safe way. And that's huge. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And perhaps we don't know, sometimes people may have mentioned that they're feeling like a burden on other people, or they're even thinking of suicide, and they've been dismissed, or maybe they mention it to someone who said something like, oh, it's just, you're just having a bad day, you'll be okay. And that often comes from a place of either judgment or not understanding that um, suicide is 
it, it's it's a, it's an understanding of of how to accept that statement in uh, in a way that's compassionate and and not from a fear based perspective because sometimes when we hear that it can create fear or worry in us that we might say the wrong thing. I love that, Kathy. I can't tell you how many calls have come into the distress line and the reports, and the, and one was given to me personally from somebody I know saying that that was the first time that she was heard it's the first time somebody understood how guilty she was feeling that changed her life mm -hmm. and it saved her life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when i asked someone if they were having thoughts of suicide they said to me that's the nicest thing anyone has ever asked me which surprised me because i was a f in a way wondering what her response would be because it showed that i that I cared enough to ask her, and she said it helped to reduce the burden that she wasn't alone in the thinking. So, and by asking the question, we're not going to give them the thought. All the evidence and lived experience does not show that we're going to tip them into suicide, nor will it give us the idea of suicide. That's a, a myth that uh, exists, but the evidence and lived experience does not indicate that at all. Yeah, it's more not asking could be the danger. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So we're coming up to the hour. I just want to mention that in the chat, I placed um, a link to the Edmonton Association of Small Animal Veterinarians are offering free suicide awareness and prevention courses to all veterinary professionals and staff in Canada. The first offering is on Sunday. This is offered by trainers through the Center for Suicide Prevention here in Calgary, Alberta, and it's sponsored by um, P3 Veterinary Partners and Steady Gate planning. So please ch check that link and um, consider taking one of those courses. Um, I do want to thank Dixie and Reza and Phil who need, needed to go for your openness, your vulnerability, your experience, your wisdom, and just bring us all back before we leave to um, Mozart's opera called The Magic Flute. And you're probably wondering why I'm bringing this back to, to Mozart. However, in The Magic Flute, the opera, one of the characters is named Papagino. And Papagino loses his love and feels the only way out of his pain is suicide. Before he can act on it, three characters in the opera support him, walk with him, and show him that there is another way uh, to solve his problem. And he stayed alive. So named after this story, the Papagino effect is what we're doing here today. It's the influence that we can have on others to help them stay safe, the compassion that we can share. Like Reza said, helping them regain a purpose or a meaning um, in the work that one is doing. And um, to be there, to, to, as, as Dixie, you said, to walk beside them with compassion. And for all of us to learn more about suicide awareness and prevention from a knowledge and skills perspective. So I encourage all of you at the right opportunity to take some training, take mental health first aid, so we can have more Papagino effect in veterinary medicine. And with that, I will say adieu, be safe, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining. I will stay on for a few more minutes and a reminder that this has been recorded and will be posted on the CVMA website. So I'll stay on, but thank you to all. Uh, I'm just going to check to see if there's any more like questions in the chat. Just wonderful um, validation. A lot of thank yous, great resource. That's wonderful. So for those who are still on, um, if there's uh, anything you'd like to share. Uh, Dr. Leanne Benedetti is still on as our most wonderful peer supporter. So she's available uh, for one-on-one um, -on -one private message chat in the Zoom platform. Thank you, Leanne. And you can also visit Leanne's website. Leanne, you might want to put your website in the chat too if people want to reach out to you. Leanne is a certified coach and another wise person in the veterinary community. Thank you, Leanne. And Leanne is teaching, um, CVMA offers The Working Mind, which is a course that's um, developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And she's teaching um, a course on Saturday on behalf of the CVMA. So thank you, Leanne, for all you're doing in vet med and mental health and well-being. And I'll just mention one more thing as people are just leaving to go back to, I'm sure, a very busy but hopefully fruitful day, um, that the there is a number of resources which the speakers have shared and they are, will be, either will be or have already been posted on the CVMA website. Thank you to Lori, um, communications manager extraordinaire for the CVMA.
Well, Dixie and Reza, thank you so very much for the preparation, the sharing of open stories and vulnerabilities and the wisdom and expertise. Couldn't Kathy? have done this without you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so yes. much. Bye. There's a question in the chat, Kathy, about oh, the ESAP course. Oh, wonderful. Um, hello, Heather. Yes, um, the course on Sunday through ESAB is the multi-session course. No, it's called How to Talk, and it is about an hour and a half synchronous uh, facilitator-led course. So it's an initial course on suicide awareness um, course. Then the ESAB is also offering free enrollment to an asynchronous course called um, START, which is similar to how to talk, although it can be done on one's own time. You can start and stop it at any time. Um, when it comes to the multi-day courses like Mental Health First Aid, the uh, link to the Canadian Mental Health Association I put in the chat already. And then the Living Works or the Center for Suicide Prevention website would have the more multi-day courses like the ASSIST, Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training, which is the two-day course. And then the Safe Talk is the three and a half hour course all offered through the Center for Suicide Prevention. You're welcome. Nice to see you. Or nice to see your chat on the webinar. All right. Thanks, Leanne, for drawing my attention to that. I just wanted to say, Kathy, thank you. It's been quite an honor and um, yeah, quite a privilege to be on this. So thank you. And I learned a lot from it about your profession too. Well, thank you, Tixie, and thank you for all you do with the Edmonton Distress Line and the suicide intervention skills that you provide up in Northern Alberta and also throughout Alberta with the suicide awareness and prevention courses you teach. And I may see you in a course down the road. That You're a master trainer. So maybe I can get trained by you at one point in time to facilitate assist. That would be my, my goal, my retirement goal. <laughs> right on, Kathy. All right, take care, Dixie. And thanks, Reza. If you need to jump off, thank you so much. I appreciate um, all that you bring to veterinary medicine. And thank you uh, for teaching mental health first aid. You're welcome. Thanks for the invite. And uh, I will uh, send the PDF uh, format to you later on. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. Already. Thank you. Thank you, too, Dr. Reza. Have a good one. Bye-bye.